so hello everyone welcome to the second uh, session of our portfolio review workshop organized in the frame of eduard 2021 project uh, we are happy to welcome Jörg Scheller, who is a art historian, professor, musician. Pub uh, he is also publishing uh, text on art history um, in various magazines uh, and teacher at the Zurich Art University with us, who will um, uh, make a sh short, I believe, presentation on the uh, portfolio and its uh, uh, use in the artistic uh, cultural world. Last uh, time, you remember, we had a presentation by Maxim uh, Polyakov from uh, Kolkhoz Collective, uh, who introduced uh, their own artistic practice as a collective, but also who presented uh, his understanding of the portfolio, how does it work, how can it help us, the artists, to formulate our um, vision, to represent ourselves, our identity, artistic practice. <clears throat> and we had these two questions in mind, like uh, portfolio as a way to talk about yourself and help you uh, structure your own uh, practice uh, so it's more like an internal uh, tool for organizing uh, the content and uh, for uh, uh, sort of expressing uh, the way uh, an artist works but also there were many practical questions like how should we make the portfolios in terms of what programs to be used if it should be online like in instagram or should it be just a wordpress site or a pdf or a, just a simple written text and the, how to uh, select uh, the content for portfolios on different occasions for example if we are invited in a festival or in a, or by a gallery uh, how how to proceed in those cases so this is like the practical part of the use of portfolio so this the discussion basically was oscillating between these two uh, uh, in this frame and uh, i hope today to re we receive more answers to these questions uh, from york and uh, we see other examples of um, <coughs> artists using their portfolio so uh, york welcome we are again happy to see you with us this year uh, as our uh, already <laughs> uh, regular partner and um, participant in our projects. We are very happy to see you and uh, yeah, take your time. Uh, we, in total, we have today three hours, so we have quite a lot of time, but let's see how to use it so that we are not totally <laughs> tired by the end. Uh, so I let you speak and if you need to do to share the screen just let me know if you need help with that okay uh, thank you so much for the introduction and apologies again um, for missing the last session due to uh, my uh, internet provider problems um, so I hope everything works out uh, today and I won't be gone in a couple of minutes as, uh, as last time so um, Vladimir asked me um, to give a brief introduction into um, how we deal with the portfolio issue, how we deal with portfolios and how we teach portfolio, portfolio making at the Zurich University of the Arts. So I prepared a short presentation and I will um, share um, my screen with you yeah okay so i hope you can see it because you are gone now i only see um my pdf so uh, in case you don't see anything or you hear you don't hear anything um uh, please let me 
let me know by voice because I only see my own um, PDF. So as a very uh, basic uh, differentiation, I would um, distinguish between a portfolio as a service in, say, the art business and a portfolio as an extension of the artwork uh, or the art works or the artist's uh, persona. So basically, we can conceive of the portfolio as a sort of like a, a business card, as something that makes it like easy to get an access to your work. That is what I would call service oriented. But a portfolio can also be something that makes it maybe complicated and interesting and challenging to access your work. So in the context of say, the international art industry, the trend definitely goes in this direction. So portfolio should um, be an, an entry point, like an easy entry point uh, to your work. But personally, I am uh, always a little bit skeptical um, in this regard, because uh, there is uh, a tremendous streamlining uh, going on. Yeah, so artists' portfolios are streamlined. They are being standardized. They are uh, being rationalized, um, if you like, um, in order to uh, be able to, to check them and read them and understand them and evaluate them uh, more easily. But that has nothing to do with, with art, obviously. So um, I think that is a, a decision that every artist makes for himself or herself. Like, how do I view myself? Am I like um, the service-oriented guy or am I the, the guy who is so like fishing for complications and making things a little bit more difficult? And actually, that is what art is all about. No? Art is not about um, making life more easy um, and making um, life more uh, standardized, but it's, it's adding some sort of um, extra flavor. So um, when we look at the artist's portfolio as a service, um, we can see that in the last years or even decades already, there is um, um, like literature um, is, is, is growing. There are many books being published about how to write artist statements, how to create portfolios, how to market yourself, how to write a resume, how to write an artist statement, et cetera, et cetera. So there is much literature uh, out there. And accordingly, um, the um, portfolios become um, more and more, I, uh, I would say, um, alike. Yeah? So they resemble each other a lot. I've been a member of many juries, and it's basically always uh, the same uh, these days. You hardly come across a portfolio where you think like, like what, what, what is this? I don't get it. And, and, and still you find it exciting and inspiring. So that hardly happens. So, um, but nevertheless, when we um, take the idea seriously that in some contexts it is advisable um, to have, say like this business card style portfolio, what every portfolio should um, uh, contain besides reproductions of your work, uh, links to audio files, video files, uh, whatsoever. Um, there should be some sort of resume or, uh, or artist statement. Um, so I brought you an example from uh, Katie Kramer's uh, book, Artists Right to Work, where you see like one of those regular standard um, uh, resumes that you will find in uh, most uh, portfolios and that actually makes sense for, for juries or for residencies, or when you're applying for a, a PhD a program or uh, whatsoever. So that is certainly um, a constitutive element of the portfolio. But then again, I would always also stress that it is possible not to do it. But then you should indicate somehow like why you don't do it. There should be like a strong gesture of, of like, <laughs> 
resistance, if you like, against this uh, streamlining process. So simply leaving it out, simply not doing it is not enough. I would say there needs to be something else that somehow shows the viewer why you don't do what the others um, do. Then um, the way we, we always have a regular portfolio course in our um, a degree program, that is the Bachelor and the Master of Fine Arts at the Zurich University of the Arts. So um, that is being taught to the students regularly. And some key elements, um, I would say, is first of all, that when you have a portfolio that contains texts and Obviously, most portfolios contain texts, and be it only email addresses, um, then you should um, really carefully consider the form, the function, and the context of the text. Um, are you submitting your portfolio for a portfolio review? Um, um, do you use it to for project proposals, for funding applications, um, or do you apply for um, maybe like support for a catalog production, et cetera, et cetera. So I would always um, um, uh, advise to adapt the portfolio to the specific uh, context. Um, and that first and foremost means matching the length and the style of the text um, to, to function. And also in digital portfolios, obviously, you should always have the links to your videos, to your sound files, uh, et cetera. Um, it's very in, uh, important to have a meaningful dramaturgy in the text. For instance, when you submit your portfolio to a, a jury um, where many portfolios are being reviewed, you should always um, um, pay great attention to the first sentences of your artist statement or the introductory remarks or, um, or the descriptions of uh, certain works. Because, like the um, jury members, they just scan. No, they just scan. They search for certain keywords, and if nothing catches their attention, then they just um, uh, pass um, on to the next um, uh, port portfolio. Yeah. So strong introductory sentences in artist statements or in any other texts um, are very recommendable. And then again, as I mentioned at the beginning, like there are some basic decisions uh, to be made. Um, do I include texts that are art themselves, that are part of my artistic practice, that kind of like extend my persona? Or is it really just a text about art? Do I want to have a nice, a clear, coherent, maybe scholarly uh, text? Or do I uh, want some like badass renegade um, stuff in there that really like people think like what 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 is it yeah that can be exciting and you can stand out amid all you know like these smooth careerist uh, artists who submit their portfolios to a uh, jury uh, review yeah so again we have like a service oriented text or we have text as disturbance both i would argue is um, is, is possible and it's always good to really consider that you have uh, these, 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 these options. So the text can serve uh, as a sort of like myth. It can mythologize your work. It can add some extra poetic quality to it. Um, or you can write something that is intended to enlighten your work, to really explain what it is about, um, like seriously, um, et cetera. You can also write like cheerful, playful um, uh, texts about your work, full of irony um, and so on. But then again, in um, in the art business, in the art industry, the chances are high that um, there will be some uh, misunderstanding because people don't have like the time, the energy to really um, dive into these texts and to really um, try to understand them and get the irony. So. Then another decision that I think is a very basic one is like, do you write your own text? Um, do you give your own statement or do you have it written? That is also, I think, something that is very fundamental. Do I speak with my own voice? Is it me who states something in my portfolio? Or do I have a colleague from like, like art history, an art critic, um, et cetera, 
who um, writes a text about me and my work. Um, so basically, when we look at this pragmatic um, art industry, art business side uh, again, um, things are pretty clear. An artist statement in the portfolio is like a pitch or like a TED talk. Um, so I quote from, from Kramer from a book from uh, 2018. Some compare the written artist statement to one minute verbal elevator spiel. A verbal elevator pitch, a TED talk and the written artist statement share the same, the same objective to communicate clearly and pers persuasively. Both for verbal and written modes of communication, all these standards apply. Make an excellent introduction, first impression. I already kind of mentioned that. Create a story that engages and informs. Provide contact information uh, that sometimes is actually uh, forgotten. For an artist, this might mean rattling off media or techniques during a chance encounter at the coffee house or an art opening. The analogy of the two minute TED talk applies as well, engaging in a quick and concise dialogue that gets the idea across without any fluff or filters. The objective to communicate the enthusiasm an artist has for her work, uh, quote end. So here, you, I think you really get this, this, this um, the, the sense that this is really very close to uh, processes we know from the industry. Yeah, you have to be short, uh, concise, you have to get a message across. So that is really about communicating uh, clearly and also like advertising yourself. Yeah, show your enthusiasm. Like personally, again, I'm, I'm very like, skeptical um, about this um, because it's it's really not what I expect from, from artists in, in the first place. I would rather like to be surprised and I would rather um, like to not understand in the first place. But then again, I would like to not understand in an interesting and in an inspiring way. And that would be your task to, to achieve um, uh, this if you do not want to have this kind of like streamlined uh, portfolios. Um, I brought you a nice example how not to write or talk about your art. And that is something that is I think, quite typical um, uh, uh, briefly after graduating. When you're an emerging artist, you don't have a career yet. You try to be like super complicated and you try to be super elaborate and you try um, to, to really show what your work is all about and how full and rich it is with references and with contexts and with, with uh, you know, like, um, um, like all, all sorts of things and what you have read and what you have seen, uh, etc. And usually your work will not benefit uh, from that. So let us uh, just uh, briefly have a look at um, a video that I brought. I have to share another screen. So, can you see my browser? Does it work? Okay. And can you hear? My practice is really about, uh, you know, like the ephemeral and, and the temporal and like just this juxtaposition between gesture and text and, and stillness and movement. And, and I really try to do it in a way that's like not over aestheticized because like I really want to evoke this, this pure sense of nostalgia for the viewer. But, but the viewer, I mean, I don't even think about the viewer because I'm not like a sellout. <laughs> but like that brings like this whole idea of commodification and like America and like how society is like so obsessed with consumption and capitalism. So I use a lot of green in my paintings. And like I had this one professor who like didn't get it because he probably didn't read like chromophobia and probably doesn't even like recycle or whatever. <laughs> but like I'm basically just using this like reductive process a visual style but it's like not stylized because i'm like not a graphic designer or like like an illustrator or something but like my work is really about like the non-objective but like you know like externalized in the beholder subjective experience 
really coming out of this provisional discourse and like very akin to artists like, um, you know, like Larrabee McNabb or like Diego Cotter, or like Vervo Darashi, you know, like, uh, you don't know, you don't know their work. No, no, that's fine. Like you should really look them up though. Cause like, I mean, I don't know, whatever, like at the end of the day, my work is really like an exploration of like the Apollonian and Dionysian and like these great dichotomies and like really unpacking these opposing forces and like, you know, exploring just like primal unity, you know? Yeah. So um, that you come across a, a quite a quite often, no? Like this desperate. Um, um, did it work? The, the screen sharing. Uh, for me, it, it worked. worked. But maybe, but maybe not, not everyone. everyone. Anyway, we'll have it recorded. Okay. Okay, so back to... No, this is something that, that I come across a quite, a quite frequently at uh, the art universities where I taught and where I teach um, these days, primarily in Switzerland, but I also teach in Poland, you know, like these desperate attempts to make your work more valuable by like hyper contextualizing it and by using the most complicate, uh, complicated um, uh, language, the most academic uh, terms, um, et cetera. And, um, and that is my, like my personal opinion. Um, I think in it, it, your work hardly ever profits uh, from that. So I brought you like a counter example from the 1940s, uh, Jackson Pollock, who in a famous artist statement simply um, said slash wrote, I want to express my feelings rather than illustrate them. It doesn't matter how the paint is put on as long as something is said. On the floor, I am more at ease. I feel nearer, more part of the painting since this way I can walk around it, work from the four sides and literally be in the painting. When I'm painting, I'm not aware of what I'm doing. It's only after I get acquainted a period that I see what I've been about. Um, what I've been about. I have no fears about making changes for the painting has a life of its own. Um, so that's from the 1940s, um, obviously an old example. What, what I think is still very crucial today is that it really gives you a vivid uh, impression of what the art and the artist is all about. So it's not pretentious, it's not showing off, it's not uh, putting you um, on, um, on the highest um, a cloud of the art world or the academic world. It's very down to earth. Um, it's very like deadpan, if you like. And I think that is something that is um, actually um, a, a benefit in the art world, which tends to uh, exaggerate um, a lot when it comes to, uh, to language, verbal, verbal uh, expression. So I brought you a more recent uh, example um, from Kramer's book that is somehow in, in the vein of uh, Jackson Pollock, uh, a young art student, um, his artist statement from 2012, um, who wrote, I draw and paint from observation. I do not set out to create an image, rather I begin when moved by something I see. I draw when confronted with something that leaves me no choice but to draw. Compositions are not planned or created but found. They are arrived upon somewhere in the process. Whether the wreckage of battle, the sloughed remains of growth, or the trail left behind exploration, my paintings are an artifact of the process of looking and describing what started the work in the first place. They are the result of efforts to keep myself surprised. Again, I would say that is, that's quite down to earth. It's not pretentious. And as you uh, can see, uh, same thing 
um, uh, with uh, Jackson uh, Pollock. It's really verbally oriented language. It's like um, spoken language. Uh, you find almost no passive forms. Not my paintings are being made, but I make something. I see something. I observe uh, something. So that gives you a really an, uh, a vivid impression, and it shows the artist as someone who is really active, who is um, self-conscious, and who is um, not hiding behind academic uh, discourse. I would say. Then, like established artists, um, they hardly ever write in the first person. They have galleries. They have um, PR guys um, who write the statements uh, for them. This is just one random example about uh, Mika Rottenberg, video uh, installation artist from the United States, from the House of Wirt Gallery uh, from Zurich. So here, that's obviously a different type uh, of text. But this kind of um, artist statement or introduction to the work of the artist can obviously also be used in the portfolios of emerging artists. Um, uh, uh, with the exception that uh, there's not so much to, to reference and to, to talk about, uh, obviously. So I, I won't read this to you. Vladimir can send you uh, the PDF afterwards if you like. Um, then that is something that you probably uh, know. Um, I think that is already from 2012 or 13. Um, these days you will find um, artist statements uh, generators on the internet because due to the streamlining process and due to this homogenization and standardization of um, artist statements and portfolios um, in the art industry, algorithms can actually write your artist statement. So if you're really like um, um, not into writing artist statements, not writing texts um, for your portfolios, you can now use these online uh, tools to um, uh, write them for them. You have just to insert some keywords and then um, the internet will handle the issue for you. Yeah. So, and this is obviously only uh, possible because there is this standardized language. Otherwise, the um, algorithms, algorithms couldn't do it. Um, I show you one example. Again, I have to share another screen. Um, Um, can you see the screen now? Um, the Firefox browser, does it work? Because I don't see you when I um, share my screen. I can see it now. Okay, it should be the website 500 letters. Is that correct? Yes. Good. So th this is an, an example for one of these um, artist statements, like portfolio texts um, generators that uh, you will find uh, online. Here, for instance, I just inserted um, um, a fictional uh, Chisinau artist, Henry Cosmos, who was born in 1992 um, in your uh, beautiful city. Henry works with painting, but also with photography, installation, art, and he's also interested in conceptual stuff. Um, and his main themes are obviously, as for every artist, alienation, appropriation, irony, social criticism, urbanity, utopia. So you insert these keywords, this information, and then um, the program will create a beautiful text for you. Henry Cosmos makes paintings, photos, installations, and conceptual artworks. In a search for new methods to read the city, Cosmos tries to create works in which the actual event still has to take place or has just ended. Moments evocative of atmosphere and suspense that are not part of a narrative, narrative threat, et cetera, et cetera. So here you find all like the, the, the cliches 
that you find um, in so many artist statements and portfolio texts. Um, and I find that quite interesting because if this process, process uh, can be automatized, it's actually good for us because we know what the cliche is. So if we know what the cliche is, then we can do uh, something else and we can set ourselves uh, apart. But somehow you have to know the, the enemy, uh, as it were. Um, yeah. So, so much for uh, the text. Maybe I will show you um, a couple of examples that we use in our portfolio courses. So um, we usually um, present the students uh, a selection of artists' uh, portfolios, and then we discuss um, with them the pros and the cons of these portfolios um, regarding the structure, regarding the use of images, regarding the texts that you will find um, in these portfolios. So I selected three portfolios that we use as exemplary ones, not exemplary in the sense of they are great or they are very bad, but exemplary in terms of that we can discuss uh, issues and that we can understand and see how a portfolio works or doesn't uh, work. So the first portfolio I'm going to present is by Carlier, um, uh, not by Lucia Carlier, um, artist from the French part of Switzerland. And here we go. So, can you see the PDF? Okay. So that is already a statement, I would, I would say. The portfolio, which is a, a PDF, um, but could also be a, a website, um, starts with an image. Uh, I think that is already a decision that is uh, super important. Do you start with, um, you know, like Vladimir Us, um, a portfolio 2021 and an email address? Or do you start with an image? That sets the tone for the reception of your work, obviously. So um, in the case of uh, Lucia's uh, portfolio, the second page is a, is a resume, uh, what we have just seen um, by the example of uh, Kramer's um, a book. So one of these, say like standardized um, resumes that gives you like all the information that are say, like career relevant in the art world. So you will find the contact information, um, where the artists come from, um, when she was born. So you, you get a, uh, you already have a sort of like a picture and you can see how that's rather mid-career artist, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's also juries who just scan the, the prices and uh, the residencies and uh, where the respective artists studied. Uh, they checked the networks um, and so on and so on. So and then um, Lucia continues again with reproductions of her, uh, of her work. Um, it's mostly like one page, one work. So which gives ample space to uh, present it. You don't have the uh, feeling that it's very cramped but um, there is really like space for the works uh, to breathe, breathe. And you have um, the, the regular information, um, the title, um, subtitle, um, year, the materials and um, the sizes. Um, what we don't get here and that I would say is um, um, maybe like a, a minus, we don't know if this is now shown in an exhibition, for instance. Yeah? So is that part of a, of a, of a bigger uh, plan? Is that um, uh, solitary work? So this uh, we don't see. Here we see that it is presented in, obviously in some um, exhibition uh, space, but we don't know the, the spatial context. So you can also decide to only show the work without the wall, without any spatial context. All these are decisions uh, that, that you make. 
but all these works that she shows here, they are hung, they're hung on the wall. And so it goes on. Um, it's a very, I would say like down to earth um, uh, portfolio, um, very convenient to, to screen and to scan. You get a good impression of what her work um, is all about. It's also the resolution is quite important. If you have detailed works, then it's super important that um, the potential jury members, they can zoom in and uh, can zoom out. Um, so in, in case of this uh, uh, work, maybe you're interested to um, get an impression uh, how it's done technically. So zooming in and out is actually quite, uh, quite important. And uh, so it goes on, it goes on, it goes on. And um, there is actually nothing um, new or no great divergence from a regular um, portfolio. Just that in the end, um, instead of an artist statement, uh, Lucia decided to include an interview uh, that was, um, was uh, conducted um, when she uh, was 26 years uh, old. And I think that's also a decision. Do you have like a statement, like a manifesto style? This is me, I do this, that. Or do you want to have a conversation? So all these are decisions that, that matter. And do you want to place the statement in the beginning? Or do you want to place the statement in the end? Again, that sets the tone. Yeah? Here, I think she really um, stresses that in her case, it's um, more about the, the work and not so much about like the context or what the artist thinks about it or how she contextualizes it. Um, it starts with the image, then there's the service oriented part where you can like quickly uh, gather the information that you need. Then you have um, the big picture, um, what her art is all about. And then in the end, only you get like the context and the verbal statements by uh, the artist. In terms of length, I would say that is a, a, a great portfolio because you can um, look at it quite um, quickly. Um, it gives you a good impression um, and it's simply not too long. Many uh, portfolios tend to be uh, too long. And that brings me to my second example namely by Hanne Lippert. Just one moment. So Hanne Lippert is an artist and uh, from the UK. She lectures at our university or she used to lecture at our uh, university and um, Hanne mostly works with text. So her work is about text as a material, um, um, as a medium, and obviously as a message. She uses text um, in written form, but also uh, verbal language, spoken uh, language, but basically it is about um, a text. So here, her portfolio starts with her with her name and with an artwork, with an installation um, uh, she did in, in Pristina. Um, and then it simply uh, continues with um, images and descriptions of the work. And now here I would say, and we will browse through just, um, just briefly that she has great reproductions of her, of her work, but the texts are quite long. So this is a portfolio that makes sense in a context where, really, where people have time to read texts and to really dive into her work deeply. It probably it would not make sense for um, an emerging uh, artist who um, applies for, for funding, for a scholarship, 
um, where people really just like very briefly and superficially like check your portfolio 30 seconds, uh, one minute maximum. Yeah. Here it's really extensive. There is it's great images, um, like high quality, good photographers. Uh, obviously, you have all the relevant information. Um, you know where the work is uh, situated. You know about the material. Um, you know if it's uh, if it's a sound um, installation, mixed media installation, duration, etc. All uh, everything is there, but the text that she includes in her portfolio, they are um, they take up a lot of a lot of space, as we will see when we uh, continue uh, browsing. So it's text, text, text. It's almost like a magazine. So so for me, this portfolio rather feels like a publication. Uh, in its own right, um, well, a, a book um, uh, almost. It's also um, different languages. Sometimes it's German. Sometimes it's uh, it's English, and and on and on and on. So when you compare this with Lucia's um, uh, portfolio, you see it's really a long portfolio. Yeah? It's like a retrospective, like a, a big retrospective. In, in PDF uh, form. So even when you're an emerging artist and you have already have many works, I would advise um, not to include um, so many works, but to really make concise and, and poignant um, a selection. Yeah. So. And here also we don't have contact information, if I uh, remember correctly. That's really a, a portfolio that would need some um, additions if you want to use it in like this uh, in, in the art business uh, industry, whatever you would like uh, to call it. And then as a last example, um, one last uh, portfolio is by Simon Paco, another um, artist from the French part of uh, Switzerland, um, young artist born in 1985. Let me just quickly share my screen again. Simon Paco. So here, yet another example, um, how to introduce yourself. So here it's really, it's, it's the artist, it's the name. And as I mentioned before, that sets the tone. It really makes a difference if you put one of your artworks on the first page or if you put your own name on the first um, page or if you put contact information on the first page, you will always present yourself in a, in a different light. So here it's really um, poison green plus the artist's name. But then, and that's um, I think that's interesting, it's um, uh, really images so it's very like short information not much text he really focuses on the images and i think one problem here is that he puts or squeezes many images on one page so you really have to zoom in and zoom out if you want to understand what this is you know when you see what what What's that material? What is this actually? Yeah, you have to maneuver through and you have to scroll and, and scan and try to understand. So it's really, it's a statement. He focuses on the images. It's not much text, which really says, I'm a visual artist. That is my business. I'm not really interested in like explaining and contextualizing everything uh, at length. But if you make this decision, then why don't or why don't you make it big? Yeah, one uh, image per per page, so that we can really see and we can really enjoy it. Um, so it so it goes on, it goes on, it goes on, um, and then only in the end will you find uh, a very short text in, in French that very like briefly um, introduces the artist what um, he's interested in, why he does what um, he does. It's a rather poetic text. Um, so I, here I would say that the text, the artist's statement, 
which is in the third person, um, is not one of the service-oriented texts. It's rather a little bit like a philosophical, um, a poetic a take on the artist's uh, personality. And then um, you have a, a resume where he studied, um, where he showed his works, and which prizes, um, you know, which um, uh, he was awarded, and in which publications he was included. So in terms of length, I would say also like, very, very good, really makes a sense. You get, uh, the, you get a good impression of what the work is all about. But um, one of the problems is really that the, the images are too small and it's, it's too many uh, things crammed into, into one page. So um, that, would, that would have been my brief um, presentation about uh, portfolio making. Um, writing artist statement. Um, I hope you could take something uh, out of this. Maybe some of the stuff was redundant and you already heard it uh, last time. But um, since I could not be with you last time, um, I don't know if I made any repetitions or no. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jörg. <clears throat> Uh, I, I think it was very interesting and very practical also to all of us to hear this presentation, especially because it is um, it has the um, it is already been repeating repeated many years, I believe, in the context of the university and sort of build itself as a as a methodology of teaching. Yes, and here we are more like uh, interpreting. <laughs> <laughs> a different uh, like examples, but without a very specific methodology. Also, That's because right. of the, also because of the lack of uh, uh, of the um, art market in Moldova, mm -hmm. where you usually don't apply. Um, like it's not this strategy of making a business oriented model makes no sense locally, at least. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's a great, that's that's a great opportunity um, also uh, for you for you guys to think of something new because I uh, see in our context it's now it's it's more or less like standardized so people created a sort of like formula like how to do uh, things and um, that's really like business now that's why I stressed it so much in, in the beginning I mean the whole art world and art industry becomes uh, more like service oriented, uh, project oriented, uh, etc. It's also many like commissioned works are back. They are in full swing uh, already. So you're constantly applying. And so you know that from Oberlich as, as well. Um, and I think that has brought um, about this uh, sort of like streamlining. And in contexts where this streamlining is not so strong, I think there is a space for opportunity to, to recreate you know, and, and rediscuss and rethink and reevaluate and not just repeat what has been uh, done, done already. Um, I have a question to all of us. Uh, would you like me to translate now shortly to, to make a short uh, resume of what you are presented? Вопрос к русскоязычным участникам. Хотите ли вы, чтобы сейчас э, мы сделали небольшой перевод, это может занять 5-10 минут, а, или вы хотите, уже у вас есть готовые вопросы, которые вы хотите задать Йоргу, uh, or if you have any concrete questions already, which you would like to ask right now, and then we do the uh, translation. How, uh, because I don't want to stop the conversation in this moment if you feel like continuing it. <clears throat> How do you feel? For me, everything is fine. So. Я думаю, небольшой перевод все-таки нужен. Спасибо. Тогда давайте сделаем сейчас перевод. Если кому-то нужна пауза, if anyone needs a break, just take a 5-10 minutes break. I will in the meantime translate. And then you can join back for maybe we can discuss a little bit about uh, the and you have made big concrete questions to ask still if you feel the need. Попробую коротко из презентации. Одну секунду.
Влад, будет перевод или вы пока решаете? У тебя микрофон просто выключен. Извиняюсь, это тоже технические моменты. Я хочу как раз сейчас перевести то, что вкратце то, что было сказано. Если вы помните немного слайды, как они начинались, то первый слайд был про портфолио как сервис или портфолио как продолжение нашей художественной практики. В принципе, это два способа, в которых можно использовать портфолио. И, конечно, разные художники по-разному... Я, кстати, тоже могу сделать share screen, чтобы было видно, про что мы говорим. Мы вспомним эти слайды. Видно презентацию сейчас, экран мой. Скажите, если видно. Тогда продолжаем. Значит, в некотором смысле, что произошло, как бы есть вот эти два подхода. И Йорг нам попытался объяснить каждый из этих подходов. Если говорить про первый пример, портфолио как сервис, это больше как, скажем, практическое такое инструмент для коммуникации про нашу работу. И это в некотором смысле инструмент, который упрощает коммуникацию, нашу коммуникацию, с, скажем, с миром искусства, но который, скажем, больше мы говорим про коммерческий мир искусства, потому что он так работает. Просто... Часто у людей нет этого времени, чтобы э, рассматривать тебя как очень комплексная персональность. Поэтому художники прибегают к э, упрощенным формулам портфолио, где очень четко э, э, сказано, скажем, э, есть кор очень конкретные описания, есть очень... Э, есть, это довольно короткие формы с конкретными описаниями, с довольно стандартизированным языком. Они очень часто напоминают нам вот эти TED-конференции, когда мы, когда мы в 10 минут должны рассказать очень много всего и быть буквально очень четко и выражаться очень четко. И, и быть понятым. И это привело к тому, что очень много портфолио сегодня выглядит очень стандартизированными, наподобие вот этого, где, в принципе, это некая, некая биография, очень стандартизированная, с базовыми какими-то описаниями. Есть даже, Йор говорил, что есть даже пособия, которые могут тебя научить, как создавать твое портфолио, то есть как его лучше создавать. Есть даже такие материалы, которые могут помогать в этом процессе описания портфолио. Если говорим о портфолио как о продолжении нашей художественной практики, то они... Не обязательно, они наоборот не стандартизированы. Художник он не хочет ничего тебе продать, в принципе, он не, он не делает некий маркетинг, он занимается маркетингом. Он, э, у него э, есть желание рассказать больше о себе, о своей работе, э, и он будет использовать часто не стандартный язык, нестандартизированный формат, и будет пытаться заинтересовать тебя как... Э, через э, вот эту дозу э, необычного или чего-то не рассказывая до конца, какого-то элемента, который ты не можешь понять до конца, и вот это, наоборот, он будет эксплуатировать, чтобы заинтриговать зрителя. 
Значит, если мы говорим о что мы включаем обычно в портфолио, то это, конечно, это тексты, и этот на уровне текста обычно это текст, который принимает во внимание контекст создания портфолио, например, для чего мы создаем это портфолио. Да? То есть этот текст, который мы включим, описание, они должны исходить из того контекста и отвечать каким-то задачам. Будем ли мы включать туда э, какие-то описания проектов, мы подаем для фин... на стипендию, мы хотим, чтобы это было включено в какой-то каталог, мы будем исходить из этого и будем удлинять этот текст или, наоборот, укорачивать его, чтобы он подходил под, те, под ту цель, под которую мы создаем портфолио. Часто это портфолио... То есть желательно, чтобы в электронной версии были линки на видеофайлы, на звуки, записи. Есть некая драматургия, когда мы описываем текст. Когда мы хотим, например, привлечь внимание к чему-то, да? мы будем использовать какие-то специфичные ключевые слова, мы будем, может быть, даже использовать какие-то нестандартные выражения, чтобы заинтриговать опять э, членов жюри, которые будут рассматривать портфолио. Э, то есть эта драматургия, драматургия, она видна уже на уровне вот этого текста, когда мы предлагаем наш художественный стейтмент. Также нужно иметь во внимание, это текст, который, это художественный текст, который мы включим в портфолио, или это текст про наши художественные работы. Пишем ли мы его, этот текст, или приглашаем ли мы какого-то критика или куратора, чтобы он написал текст за нас. Это... Эти моменты, они очень важны, и это как бы наш выбор. Каждый раз мы делаем свой выбор э, насчет этого текста. Э, да, и в принципе э, мы можем, конечно, отказаться от такой формулы классической, скажем, портфолио, но нам нужно объяснить, почему мы не хотим ее ей следовать, мы не можем просто отказываться и все. Да. То есть или мы предлагаем другое портфолио взамен, или мы объясняем, почему мы, э, почему мы не согласны с этой формой, более сервис-ориентированной формой, бизнес-ориентированной формой презентации. Да, и часто портфолио сравнивают вот с этим одноминутной поездкой в лифте, да, когда мы что-то хотим продать. За 30 секунд мы хотим сказать кому-то, рассказать историю, заинтриговать и продать ему, скажем, продать себя, продать свою э, работу, э, ну, не, услов, условно говоря. И эта вот драматургия, она и, и связана с этим. То есть мы э, обычно... Представим себя очень хорошо, мы сделаем некую э, очень интересную историю, расскажем кор коротко, да, включим контактную информацию обязательно, потому что сами должны связаться. Э, и это, в принципе, как работает вот этот портфолио как сервис. Но... Да, но это не самый популярный, это не самый, скажем, для Йорга он не самый интересный, не самая интересная форма презентации, потому что она в конце концов, она в конце концов, это очень стандартная и, и никак не никак не 
не предлагает ничего э, дополнительного, что говорит об нашем искусстве, о нас как художник, о нас как художниках. И вот как другой пример презентации Йорк предлагает Полока, который прикрепляет это описание. Наверное, я уже не буду переводить, потому что займет много времени. Но это описание, в принципе, художника, который работает в мастерской, который имеет некое... Он описывает свое отношение к своей работе, которая лежит на полу. И, и с которой он имеет некое отношение. И это описание, оно очень... Оно от первого лица исходит, во-первых, оно описывает художника в процессе работы. И это, скажем, то описание, которое, наоборот, помогает читателю портфолио понять вашу художественную практику, вас как художника. Также Йорк предлагает, предложил описание, сделанное одним из молодых художников, из Пенсильвании, Грегором Бише, э, не, из университета в Пенсильвании, которые повторяют в некотором смысле вот, метод Полока. Полок, он писал свой стейт в 1940 году, и мы видим сегодня, в 2012 году, э, студента университета, который, в принципе, повторяет э, этот э, метод самопрезентации, написания стейтмента в очень таком приземленном характере и в отношении к своей работе. И это как бы имеет смысл, и мы бы вас, вам рекомендовали использовать вот этот подход, когда вы описываете себя, свою работу, в сравнении с следующим текстом, где... Уже не сам художник делает описание, это уже известный худож... известная художница Мика Ротенберг, где у нее кто-то другой делает ее описание ее работы и ее художественной практики. Это два разных подхода, которые можно, в принципе, тоже использовать, тогда, когда у вас уже серьезная карьера, вы как бы не занимаетесь созданием портфолио, эти портфолио кто-то за вас создает обычно. И даже есть такие примеры, где можно, вот такой сайт есть, 500letters.org, где он сам за себя, сам за вас может написать текст. То есть настолько стандартизированный этот текст стал сегодня для портфолио и для вообще описания и полный клише, что, в принципе, даже некий веб-сайт, работающий на базе алгоритма, может написать за вас этот текст. И вы можете даже попробовать описать себя как художника, там, например, из Кишинева, который работает там живопись, заинтересован в фотографии, инсталляции, концептуальном искусстве. И этот сайт просто создаст автоматический текст для вас. Ну, пойдем дальше по презентации. Да, я уже не делал скриншот самих трех портфолио. Последний в конце Йорк показал три примера. Три примера портфолио которые не обязательно, что хорошие или плохие, просто они экземплярны в плане, как каждый из этих художников себя представил. И если вы помните, на первом примере портфолио начинался с фотографии, и это тоже очень важно, с чего вы начинаете вашу презентацию. То есть не фотографии самой, фотографии, а фотографии работы. То есть первый пример, в принципе, мы видим довольно классический пример, и удобный для презентации, не слишком длинный. Он начинается с изображения работы, потом на второй странице вы видели некое резюме, CV, да, с, опис с короткими описаниями вашей, вашей биографии. То есть там даже нету стейтмента художника, там просто 
как бизнес-карточка, да, получается, такая, с контактами. Некоторые вот жюри, члены жюри, например, Йорг говорил, что смотрят просто на ваши, на те премии, на те, на те программы, в которых вы участвовали, это много для них значит уже, в принципе. То есть они извлекают, они сканируют эти портфолио часто на одного художника уходит пару минут, поэтому они, в принципе, читают только ключевые слова из вашего, вычитывают из вашего портфолио. И это вот тот первый пример, он, в принципе, вот так и создан, как некая частично некая бизнес-карточка, с которой можно легко вычитать контактную информацию, какие-то ключевые слова. Потом идут презентации работ, если вы помните, это была живопись большей частью, и она была представлена без своего контекста. То есть мы знаем, в принципе, что это работа, живопись, которая висит на стене, но там не представлено какого-то контекста, в котором она выставлена, эта работа. И там к ней идут кон чет конкретные описания под каждой работой, описывающие материальную часть, там, год, размер. В конце художница решает не делать свой стейтмент, а опубликовать интервью с собой. И это тоже выбор, хотим ли мы опубликовать свой стейтмент, как бы в некотором смысле сделать высказывание, или хотим мы просто создать такую ситуацию диалога, какого-то обсуждения. И она, в ее случае, она выбрала вторую модель, вот этот диалог с художником. Вторая модель портфолио, она сделана уже довольно серьезной художницей, то есть портфолио рассказывает о проекте с одной художницы с большой уже карьерой, художественной карьерой, где мы видим много работ, инсталляций, других работ. Очень много текстовых работ э, с длинными текстами, а также, а также э, салат Виктор, а также э, большие к ним описания. То есть э, это даже не портфолио, а почти что как журнал с большими описаниями к каждой работе. Все работают в очень хорошей фотографии, качество. И в этом смысле они выглядят очень, скажем, профессионально сделаны, очень, очень профессионально сделаны, как некий журнал. И там много текста, и этот портфолио ты не просмотришь за 5-10 минут, там просто нужно его читать, и это, на это может идти много часов времени. То есть мы видим совсем другой пример. Да? По длине он довольно длинный, скажем так. Молодому художнику не нужно создавать такое детальное портфолио, потому что просто ни, ни, никому, ни, ни у кого не будет времени на такой журнал. Лучше, наверное, сконцентрироваться на каких-то элементах ваших работ и представить их в более короткой длине. В случае этого портфолио, второго, второй пример, который был представлен, длина, она как бы очень длинная, и художница, в принципе, включила очень, почти что вс все работы да, про себя, или довольно много-много работ про себя. И третий пример портфолио, который, вы помните, с зеленым фоном, начинался с имени художника, то есть, в принципе, это тоже очень много говорит в сравнении с первой моделью, где портфолио начинается с изображения работы. То есть я художник, мое имя – это то, что важно. Потом идет, в принципе, неплохая презентация его работы. Это сразу видно, что это визуальный художник. Он показывает в большей степени свои работы. И там очень мало комментариев к ним или описаний. То есть это визуальное такое портфолио. И в конце он прикрепляет короткий стейтмент, больше как философия, такая перспектива больше философийная на, на искусство. И короткое резюме, в котором мы вычитываем какую-то более детальную информацию о художнике. 
Одна рекомендация была, что он слишком много изображений сконцентрировал на одной странице, то есть там по четыре фотографии на одном слайде, и это сложно рассматривать такие, такую концентрацию изображений. И, в принципе, это вот эти, эти, вот эти примеры, которые хотел Йорг нам показать сегодня. И если у вас есть вопросы к нему или комментарии, что уточнения, пока он с нами, потом, наверное, мы его отпустим. И если он не сможет быть, то лучше сейчас задать ему эти вопросы. So here it was the resume in Russian. And uh, I just repeat it, uh, if any one of the participants, if you have uh, questions, please ask them now, because we don't know if York will spend all the evening with us. Maybe it's good to ask now, yeah. Uh, so feel free to raise your hand or just uh, include the microphone and speak. And it would be great to see you a little bit more, because we now I uh, see you behind uh, pictures. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, I can I can start if um, if you can listen me. Yeah. Uh, York, uh, hello again. Hi there. Uh, last, <laughs> last last time uh, I make uh, kind of a big presentation about uh, our relation with the uh, portfolio format and in general um, format of uh, explain uh, of our practice practice and uh, our some processual uh, practice and i think it's important for uh, artists who have deals with processes uh, way of explanation because it's uh, that's one way of the documentation of all this and uh, <clears throat> just want to say that uh, uh, last autumn, uh, we speak with you about uh, dictionary like format of uh, uh, explanation and uh, um, somehow its idea growing uh, after our conversation uh, during winter. And uh, now we make already kind of um, prototype of small, small version of dictionary. I don't know if it's visible. It's called lexicon. So, and here we explain some terms that I usually use, and uh, that I usually use, and uh, it's uh, somehow help to people who come to exhibitions to our um, read our text. Uh, it um, help understand the context in which we work. And uh, also, um, it's kind of explanation of our universe, let's say, artistic work, uh, because uh, I think one of main uh, practices to create of new term in our terminology. And uh, so I can say, I want to say uh, thank you also for this discussion that push us. And uh, it's very important to speak with the person uh, from outside, from other contexts that uh, not so close to Moldova, to post-Soviet context, because I, I very fast check, for example, what uh, don't understand and what need to explain more, uh, because some some words it's something very banal and uh, it's something that's very like useful and we just play with this. But when you speak with person from other contexts, it, it sounds a bit like alien language or something that needs uh, more deep uh, explain with some reference, cultural reference. And uh, yeah, and uh, so this is first version that we, uh, with which we now work. Also, it's just uh, around 20 terms. We make list to around 100 terms, but uh, after see that this already called and uh, back to one stage uh, to some this uh, level of draft and some proto explanation because it's uh, for beginning it's look like uh, easy explain what in your brain and in your reality especially with members of collective with whom you cooking every day and you have synchronization that don't need to explain a lot but here you try put you in position of some person who come to your uh, planet and don't know nothing and okay let's start from beginning 
uh, and uh, explain like for kids or something like this. So it's it's really interesting, and I think for us it's also a form of uh, portfolio, um, especially uh, how I say for our uh, type of art. And uh, we think about that it's portfolio that can be sent uh, also some uh, through post system, through post infrastructure, and. Uh, uh, even a uh, form of uh, interaction, how uh, curator, artist, or just our audience will meet with our uh, portfolio. It's also we take like some form of artistic expression that how it come, how it uh, uh, that it should exist, for example, only in paper way, and how this, this way of uh, our interaction also important. So it's it's just some remark about uh, some conclusions and uh, that we uh, take from our dialogues, our discussions, and uh, so on. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the input. And I think in your case, this kind of like dictionary or booklet makes absolutely sense because these um, these portfolios that I presented now. They are more they're like this sleek, like business cards. They, they are more used for branding in, in a way. So you get a very like a quick impression of what it is all about, about the style, the aesthetics, uh, etc. Whereas you you don't have that style. You're not a brand, but you're a more you're a process. You know? And it's like it's about interaction, it's about communication, it's about so many different elements that it is very hard to to squeeze that into one like standardized portfolio. So I think like a story, a narration, or a dictionary, or um, a fanzine, or a comic book, or whatever, in, in your case, makes much more sense than this like 20 page um, like documentary with some nice photos and like an email address and, and you know, like a, a short a short text that would not um, reflect your work probably, I think. So yeah, congratulations. I, I would yeah, love yeah. to see this actually. Yeah, yeah, I think we, we uh, can exchange with the addresses and send uh, yeah. when we finish the product and you will, uh, Great. You will have it now, definitely. Great, thank but, you. <laughs> thank you too. And uh, I'm I'm start uh, uh, now this uh, presenting. So I think other participants can also uh, ask something or maybe some questions or share maybe some stay away. I think Vladimir will continue to moderate this process. Yeah, we will we will switch gradually to participants. But thank you very much, Jörg, for for today and for for being with us. It's very important for us to have friends somewhere else. And uh, yeah, I hope we meet uh, some other time this year. Also, in the if since you have an interest for post conflictual areas, I believe some of the artists here who are from Transnistrian region would be interested to learn more about your uh, research. So maybe we find some time in autumn to go back to this, this discussion or earlier, depending on your uh, availability. But we would really like to hear more about uh, uh, the research itself and to be part maybe of it uh, in the future. I hope so, yes. Um, Dagmar Reichert, who has also visited um, Chisinau uh, two times with me, and I, we are planning to, to apply for a research grant uh, focused on East Europe, post-conflict regions, peace building and the arts. So I hope we can collaborate in the future if we get the grant, which is not, not sure, obviously. <laughs> Then we wish you success with that and uh, hope to hear about you soon in the future. Uh, thank you. Bye bye. Then. Thank you. Bye bye. See you all in Chisinau sometime, hopefully soon. Yeah, uh, we have a we have a agent coming uh, in August, hopefully Ruben. So you can oh, perfect. you yes. can get in touch with him <laughs> if you need anything okay. from here. Very good. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you.